So let, let's visualize this and try to take a look at this with a specific example. And we'll keep it relatively simple. We'll try and find the absolute max and min. of the function x times y on an ellipse. And just for arguments purposes, we'll, we'll deal with a very specific ellipse. We'll take the ellipse with a distance of 3 in the x direction in a distance of 2 in the y direction. So that's described by this algebraic equation right here. So what's nice is that we can typically um, if we can draw the level curves of the function in a relatively straightforward manner, uh, we can get a nice picture of where exactly we expect the, the max and min to occur of the function. And this is without even uh, using that previous theorem, but that previous theorem holds in general regardless, which is really, really nice. So what I'll do is I'll draw the domain here that we're optimizing over in black and this ellipse is the ellipse that stretches 3 in the x direction and 2 in the y direction. So it looks like this. Sometimes we call this a curve C, just for short, to describe this curve. And then uh, this function, the function f of x, y equals x times y, I'll draw the level curves of that in red. But to get the level curves, we fix the output of the function to be equal to some fixed C value which gives us curves of the form x times y is equal to c. And we've seen that for various values of c, this gives us, this gives us you know, different curves. So for instance, when c is equal to 1, you get the curve y is equal to 1 over x. When c is equal to 0, you get the curve x times y is equal to 0, or x is equal to 0, or y is equal to 0. When c is equal to negative 1, you get the curve y is equal to negative 1 over x. So the curve y is equal to 1 over x looks uh, when x is 1, that means that y is 1. When x is 2, that means that y is 1 half. When x is 1 half, that means that y is equal to 2 right here. This is enough to give us a very preliminary plot of this level curve. It looks like this. This curve corresponds to c being equal to 1. And you have the exact same picture down here. In the negative direction as well. Because this is the curve, uh, y is equal to 1 over x. When c is equal to 0, you get the straight line going down at x equals 0. And you also get the straight line 
going across corresponding to y equals zero. So the function value on the axis is zero. And then lastly, when c is equal to negative one, we use a, a dotted line to show the curve corresponding to the curve negative one over x. This dotted line corresponds to c equals negative one. Is a dotted curve, not a dotted line. Same thing right here. And so just looking at this function, you'll see, well, we expect there to be a saddle point, so at least a saddle point at the origin right here. And uh, we actually expect the global minimum of the function to arise at these two points because the function is decreasing as you move in those two directions and we also expect the global maximum to arise right here and right here because the function is increasing as we move in that direction this is a great example without even going through and doing the computations of uh, why the theorem we showed before really makes a lot of sense specifically that we expect there to be one interior critical point of this function, uh, but we expect that point to be a saddle point. And uh, we expect the global max and min, or the absolute max and mins of this function to not be inside the domain, but on the boundary. And go, when we go through and do the computations, this is exactly what we find. So the first step for this function is to find all interior critical points. Oops, and I just realized I have a small little typo right here. Uh, we're optimizing over the ellipse. This is all points x and y, such that um, x and y, or x over 3 squared plus y over 2 squared is less than or equal to 1. This is all, side, all points inside this region right here. Um, and I guess I can shade this region to really... distinguish for us exactly what domain we're optimizing over. And this is done by searching for type points of type, both type one and type two. Um, we don't expect there to be any critical points of type two. because the function f of x, y equals x times y is a quadratic polynomial. So there are no bad points. It's a nice function of x and y, and there are no points where the function itself is a bad function. Or the derivatives of the function do not exist. There's, there's no points like that. So if there are any critical points, the only critical points that we expect are critical points of type 1. Or uh, where the gradient of the function at that critical point is equal to the zero vector. So for this function, this means that if we solve for these points, the x partial derivative of the function is going to be equal to zero. And the x partial derivative of our function is the x partial derivative of x times y, which is y. And the y partial derivative of our function is equal to x. So the only solution to these two equations, the system of equations, is the solution x equals 0, y equals 0. 
Now, if you go through and do the second derivative test on this point, 0, 0, you'll definitively show that it's a saddle point because uh, fxx is equal to 0, fyy is equal to 0, and fxy is equal to 1. So the discriminant, which is fxx times xyy minus fxy squared, is equal to negative 1 or less than 0. So this is a saddle point. Which is exactly what we predicted from the level curves of the function. So what that means is that because it's a saddle point, uh, it's not going to be the global max or min of the function because there are regions around that point where the function's higher than it that point and also lower than the value at that point. Um, and you can even you know check that the function at that critical point at zero zero is equal to zero times zero or zero. So the function value at that point is zero. And what that means from our theorem is that we're kind of forced now to look on the boundary. And what's nice about that, this example is that the ellipse is a smooth boundary and can be entirely parameterized uh, by uh, a nice, very, very nice relation. Now, you always want to remember that, that the more complicated the boundary, the more difficult part B is going to be, because you're going to have to break it up into multiple different parts and possibly parameterize multiple different parts of the boundary. But we can parameterize the ellipse as follows. So the main idea with part B is you know, break the boundary up into as many pieces as you need to parameterize it correctly and solve optimization problems uh, for the each individual piece. In this case, with the ellipse, the ellipse uh, can be parameterized very similar to the circle. We talked about this a little bit before, that we can say that x is going to be 3 times cosine theta, and y is going to be 2 times sine of theta. This is for all theta between zero and two pi. And what this does is it gives us the x coordinate and the y coordinate in terms of that, that one theta, that, that angle theta for every single point on the ellipse. So for instance, right, th this point right here is given by the angle, well, this angle is 90 degrees, or pi over 2, and this looks like it's about one-third pi over 2, so pi over 2 over 3, which is pi over 6. And uh, the correct x-coordinate and y-coordinate of that point can be found by directly plugging into this parameterization. So if you plug in theta equals pi over 6 into these two equations, you, you get the x-coordinate and the y-coordinate of that point on the ellipse. So this is the correct way that we've talked about of parameterizing the, the ellipt ellipse curve. But in general, if your domain has multiple different pieces, maybe they're, they're lines or um, different pieces, you're going to have to do this process for each individual piece. Luckily for us, the, the ellipse has a very nice parameterization, so we can just focus on 
uh, the single parameterization. But it's important to realize that you know for more complicated domains, you can still do this process. You just have to consider each individual piece of the domain individually. So the first step in this process is parameterizing the domain. into the multiple different pieces that describe it. And the second step is considering the composition, specifically the composition of the function. In our case, it's the function that we're optimizing, so f. in how it depends only on the domain, so for points on the domain. So we have our parameterization, and we're going to take this parameterization, which kind of picks out points on the domain as a function of theta, so one parameter for a function of two variables, so for a 2D domain, and we're going to plug these two points always into the function itself. Now this, through composition, creates a single variable function, which you can call anything you want, but typically I'll call it h of theta or g of theta. So h here, remember, depends on um, x and y through the function f, and both of these things depend on the parameterizations. They both depend on theta. And what that means is that we can actually go through and use our multivariable chain rule to figure out the derivative of uh, h of theta. Because this is a single variable function, all of the, the rules from single variable optimization hold. If I want to solve for a maximum or min of theta for theta in this interval, so for theta from 0 to 2 pi, what we needed to do is we need to look uh, for interior critical points of h of theta inside this interval, which is points where either the derivative of h of theta does not exist or points where uh, the derivative is equal to zero. So there are no points for h of theta because h of theta, if you if we directly plug in, you can uh, for this this example, it's it's not always uh, straightforward to plug in. Sometimes it's a little bit uh, function get more complicated. But for this, it's just going to be x of theta, which is three cosine of theta times y of theta, which is two sine of theta. And you see the h of theta here, the, the function on the boundary is just 6 times cosine of theta times sine of theta. So um, for this example, it's relatively simple to figure out what this function is on the boundary. So uh, what's nice is that you can use the multivariable chain rule that h prime of theta is going to be equal to the f or the x partial derivative of f times x prime of theta. And then that's going to be plus the f partial derivative with respect to y times y prime of theta. You can always use the multivariable chain rule if you, if you want to, to go through and do this. But you can also say if you have a simple enough function like this, you can go through and take the normal uh, single variable derivative. So you have a lot of freedom in here when calculating this h prime of theta. But the main idea is that for the interior critical points on this interval for this function h, right? there's no interior critical points of type 2. And using either the multivariable chain rule here for h or the normal single variable derivative of this function, right, you can go through and figure out how many there are of type 1.
and we'll just do the normal derivative of the function 6 times cosine theta sine theta, which in order to evaluate is going to require the product rule here. So it'll be 6 times negative sine theta, which is the derivative of cosine, times sine of theta, plus cosine of theta times the derivative of sine of theta, which is going to be cosine of theta. This is the product rule applied to this function right here. So h prime of theta is going to be equal to 6 times cosine squared of theta minus sine squared of theta. And uh, this is a critical point of type 1 that we're solving for. So this is equal to 0. And uh, when you look at this equation, this equation reduces to saying that cosine squared of theta is equal to sine squared of theta. Or taking the square root of both sides, we get that the absolute value, it says, of cosine of theta has to be equal to the absolute value of sine of theta. And th any point theta that satisfies this condition gives us an interior critical point, interior to the interval for theta from 0 to 2 pi of uh, this function h itself, because it, it means the function h, h prime is equal to 0. And uh, the solutions to this, uh, this equation right here, are exactly the following four solutions. Right? Whenever uh, the angle theta gives us a value of 1 over the square root of 2, or negative 1 over the square root of 2, for either of these two values. So you have four possible uh, values of theta where this, this happens. 1 is at pi over 4. 1 is at 3 pi over 4. Remember, pi over 4 actually corresponds to 45 degrees. And uh, so on and so forth, all, all of these... Uh, directly give us a value for either cosine or thi sine equal to plus or minus uh, the square root of one half or one over one over the square root of two. So pi over four is one value, three pi over four is another value, five pi over four is another value, and seven pi over four is the last possible value. And it, uh, if we want, we can even list out the x values at each one of these and the y values at each one of these to figure out exactly what x values and y values these correspond to. Right? For uh, pi over 4, you have that x is equal to 3 cosine of pi over 4. So x is going to be equal to 3 times 1 over the square root of 2, or 3 over the square root of 2. For 3 pi over 4, when you have, um, all right, that, that corresponds to the angle of you know, this angle right here, you have exactly that x is going to be negative 3 times 1 over the square root of 2, when you directly plug into our parameterization. Same thing for 5 pi over 4, and then for 7 pi over 4, you'll have that x is 3 over the square root of 2 again. For the corresponding y values on this ellipse, you'll have that y is going to be at pi over 4, is going to be 2 over the square root of 2. For 3 pi over 4, it's also going to be 2 over the square root of 2. For 5 pi over 4, you'll have that it's negative 2 over the square root of 2. And for 7 pi over 4, you'll have that it is also negative 2 over the square root of 2. So 
So these are potential max and mins on the boundary. And lastly, we'll, we'll write it down the, the function values at each one of these points. The function value at uh, this first point at pi over 4 is going to be, uh, the function, remember, is f of x, y is equal to x times y. So it'll be 6 over the square root of 2 times the square root of 2, or 2. So that's just going to be equal to 3. It'll be negative 3, similarly at 3 pi over 4. It'll be positive 3 at 5 pi over 4. And it'll be negative 3 at 7 pi over 4. So these are all potential max and mins of the function. And the last thing we need to do is again look at the two boundary points of that region from 0 to pi, 2 pi. So at theta equals 0 and theta equals 2 pi. But at theta equals 0 and theta equals 2 pi, uh, in both cases, either x or y is 0. So the function values at these two points is are going to be, uh, correspondingly be 0 as well, 0 and 0 for both of these two angles. So it's important to check and compare now. We have to compare these two values with these four values, and then also compare to the, the point from A, which is this value right here. And it's clear that the maximum of these, all of these values, and the minimum of all these values give us the global max and min of this function. And sure enough, the straightforward candidate is all of these values right here. And you can directly see this, that um, saying the global maximum of the function on the ellipse, on this domain, is 3. And this occurs at this point, so x and y, as well as at this point right here, x and y which I'll, I'll color in pink here so you can kind of see this directly. So the global max occurs at this point right here and at this point right here. And I'll color in, in light green, the global min of the function it occurs here and here where the function hits a value of negative three. The value of negative 3 occurs at this point right here. And this point right here. And there you have it. So this is this is a great, great, great example for showing in general how to go through and do this. Uh, to solve an optimization problem. You know, in general, the idea here is that um, we can go through and directly solve an optimization problem by comparing the interior critical points of a function to the boundary points of a function, to the possible max and mins on the boundary. Um, and we'll see that with Lagrange multipliers, uh, things become a little bit more uh, easy to deal with. Uh, the specific uh, problem of solving for max and mins of a function on the boundary become a little bit easier to deal with. And so just to kind of verify what we've done here, um, I've uh, plotted out uh, the um, density contour plot of our function. And uh, you can very clearly see here uh, the one interior uh, saddle point, or the one interior critical point, which is a saddle point, so it's neither a max nor a min. And um, oh, we also see uh, the, the four points in the boundary that we identified as the uh, potential absolute max and min of this function. And uh, we, you know, we actually verify that these are, the uh, on this region, the absolute max and min. Um, and 
or I've plotted out a surface plot kind of showing this function, uh, the graph of this function, and you can very clearly see that those at those four points that we calculated, uh, we have that the function contains its global maximum and minimum values on this region. This is the uh, ellipse with uh, an A of 3 and a B of 2. And if we kind of rotate this around a little bit, we can very clearly see that those values that we computed directly correspond to uh, the absolute max and min of our function. So this is very, very neat. So for our last example, I'll go over an example of a piecewise domain in 2D, which is uh, another good, be a good example problem to show how to deal with a domain that's a piecewise domain for optimization of a function of two variables. Specifically, we'll talk about optimizing the function Two x squared minus four x plus y squared minus four y plus one. And we'll optimize this function. So search for the global max and min over the following domain. Consider you want to optimize this function over the triangular domain bounded by the line y equals 2 and the line y equals 2x. So we'll say that y equals 2, this is y equals 1, say y equals 2, so the line y equals 2 is this line right here, and the line given by y equals x, well, y equals 2x, x goes over by 1, it's exactly this line right here, the line going up through the origin hitting that point right there. Just make it move it up a little bit to make it look a little bit more correct. So hit this point right here. And this is the line y equals 2x. So the, the region bounded by the line y equals 2 and y equals 2x is exactly this domain right here. In which case this domain has uh, a couple of different boundaries. It has the boundary corresponding to x equals 0, it has the boundary corresponding to y equals 2, and it has the boundary corresponding to this line y equals 2x. Our procedure is still directly the same as before. The first step is to identify all interior critical points. That's step A. And for this function, because it's a quadratic polynomial, there are no interior critical points of type 2 only critical points of type 1. So 
this is where fx is the partial derivative with respect to x. This is going to be 4x minus 4 is equal to 0. And simultaneously, the y partial derivative, which is 2y minus 4. is equal to zero. So the solution to this system of two equations corresponds to x is equal to one and y is equal to two. And you'll notice that this actually corresponds to this point right here. This is the point x equals one, y equals two. So it's not actually interior to the domain, but it's still within the domain of consideration. So this is a potential max and min, the point one comma two. And at this point, our function is going to be what you get when you plug this point in. So it's going to be 2 times 1 squared minus 4 times 1 plus 2 squared, which is 4, minus 4 times 2, which is 8, plus 1. So our function value at this point is going to be negative 2 plus negative 4 plus 1 or negative 5. This is a potential max or min of our function. So this concludes our part A. And then for step B, we have to go through and investigate this at each different possible uh, boundary or piece of the boundary. So for piece one of the boundary, we'll take this as x equals zero. in y between 0 and 2. For this piece of the boundary, our function is just a function of y, and it's the composition of x equals 0 and y, for y from 0 to 2. When we plug this into our function, we end up getting the function y squared minus 4y plus 1, which doesn't have any critical points of type 2, only a potential critical point of type 1 when h prime of y or 2y minus 4 is equal to 0. And this happens when y is equal to 2. So uh, according to our optimization theorem, we now have uh, for this boundary piece, three potential max and mins, a potential max and min at 0, comma 0, a potential max or min at 0, comma 2, and a potential max or min at this interior critical point, which is uh, 0, 0, comma 2 as well. It's the boundary point of our domain. 
really we only have two potential uh, ma absolute max and mins. The function value at each one of these points is at 0, 0, the function is 1 when you plug in, and at 0, 2, the function when you plug in is equal to negative 3. So this is the first piece of our boundary. The second piece of our boundary consists of, we'll call it the top piece. So we just did the first piece, which is this left piece. The second piece of the boundary is when y equals 2. And x is between 0 and 1. For this piece, our function, our single variable function that we have to consider is a function of x. Specifically, it's the function when you plug in x and y is equal to 2. Which is the function 2x squared minus 4x. Then when you plug in y is equal to 2, you get 2 squared, which is 4, minus 4 times 2, which is 8, plus 1. So h of x is the function 2x squared, minus 4x, minus 3. So again, this is a polynomial function, so there are no critical points of type 2. The only critical point inside the domain from 0 to 1 is when the derivative of the function h is equal to 0, which corresponds to the equation 4x minus 4 is equal to 0, which gives us an interior critical point of x is equal to 1 for this function h. So from our optimization theorem and 1D calculus, this means that we have um, a couple different possible um, absolute max or min locations Specifically, the potential absolute max and min locations are the boundaries of this line, this point, and this point, and then also the point x equals 1, y equals 2, which actually corresponds to one of these boundary points. So the first potential boundary uh, max and min for this function h of x it's at the point x equals 0, y equals 2. Then we solve for the other potential maximum endpoint, which is x equals 1, y equals 2. So at 0, 2, we actually already solved for this. The function is equal to negative 3 when you plug in the point 0, 2. And at the point 1, 2, it's equal to negative 5. So it turns out we already, we already kind of solved for that point when it's also one of our interior critical points that we ended up solving for. And the, the last piece of this domain 
corresponds to the piece of the domain that is uh, the bottom of the domain or the line y equals 2x. And this is again for x between 0 and 1. When y equals 2x, this composition function, the function h of x, is going to be f at x, and then y equals 2x, which when, when we plug into the function f, ultimately will give us 6x squared minus 12x plus 1. Because this is a polynomial in X, there are no critical points of type 2, only critical points of type 1, and taking the derivative of this function gives us 12x minus 12 equals 0, or x is equal to 1, again. So the potential max and min for uh, on this this boundary right here corresponds to again it's x equals zero comma zero and then x equals one comma two because this is our interior critical point for this 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 function on the domain for x from uh, zero to one. You always have to compare the boundary to the, the interior critical point, but uh, for this example, it's a nice example because it's giving us uh, the same result. It's giving us a boundary point as well as this interior critical point, but you always have to compare these two values. So at 0, 0, the function we've already seen, we've evaluated it, it's 1. And then at the point x equals 1, y equals 2, the function is negative 5. So the final step of this procedure is to compare the results from A to B. And you see that the lowest value out of all of the values we've calculated is the value of the function at the point 1, 2. The function is negative 5 at 1, 2. And the largest value of the function is the value of the function at 0, 0. I'll circle that in red. So because of this, we conclude that the absolute maximum value of the function occurs here at the origin. And the absolute minimum value of this function occurs at the point 1, 2, where the, the function at the minimum value is negative 5, and the value of the function at the, the absolute maximum is 1. So here we see a visualization of the uh, contour plot and density plot for this function, as well as the region, this triangular region uh, that we're considering. We uh, solve for the global max, uh, which is at 0, 0, and the global min, which is at 1, 2. This is exactly what we're seeing on this region right here. <coughs> Specifically, if we rotate this plot, I give a, a 3D view of the graph. Uh, we can very clearly see uh, exactly that what we computed was exactly correct. Um, there are no interior critical points. Um, there is one uh, one of the critical points that we solve for, which is at this point one two, um, and uh, we calculated uh, that the the global maximum on this region, on this domain, is here at zero zero, and the global minimum is at uh, one two.
this is a very neat uh, demonstration, right, showing that uh, our method is working very, very nicely. So this is a, a nice summary of how to do this, even if you have a piecewise domain. It shows you that uh, we can apply this procedure regardless of the, how, what the shape of the domain is, and even if you have a more complicated domain, it just requires your step B to have more cases. But this example will conclude today's lecture. Thank you very much for, for listening, and I hope you learned something and uh, had a great day.